Hey, everybody. This is Sean Kelly. I am going to present the material from chapter one uh, of our book, Astronomy at Play in the Cosmos by Adam Frank. So we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so number one, uh, this beautiful picture of a place called Newgrange is located in Ireland. And I've actually been there. Uh, pretty amazing place. Actually, just give me one second. I just want to check that this is actually working. It seems like it is working. Okay, so I just did this a whole hour's worth and discovered that um, none of it was recorded. So that was a little bit of a disappointment, but um, let me just make sure then. Okay, I think it's all good. Seems to be working. And let's just see. Sorry about that. I will try not to do this in the future. Usually, yep, yeah, it works. Okay, great. Okay, so um, so Newgrange is in Ireland, and it's uh, just a, a little while, uh, about half an hour north of Dublin by car. And it is a giant burial mound. Actually, they called it a burial mound before they really knew what it was. In fact, we don't really know entirely what it was, but it's, it's quite old, it's probably 5,000 years old. And um, what they've discovered is something quite amazing that there's an opening that you come in, this is where you come in, and there's actually, this is the doorway below it, but there's an opening here that lets sunlight in. And right around the time of the winter solstice, around December 21st, the light from the sun in the morning will come through that opening and make it all the way to the central chamber, almost 75 feet into the center chamber and illuminate a bowl. And they think that what it, it was, it was used for some kind of ceremonies. They're not sure exactly what, uh, but this is a very special place. This place was built to face the winter solstice sun. And so that's a pretty neat thing to understand that ancient people consider that to be an important moment, right? And you can kind of think about that. It's the shortest day of the year. And then the days will start to get longer again. So the middle of the winter, this was um, a time when you would want to look forward to the springtime that would be coming. So that's a neat thing to understand. And there's monuments around the world. And then here's another one. This is uh, Chichen Itza, the temple of Kukulkan. And uh, Kukulkan is the serpent god. And if you look along the edge of the pyramid, you can see the serpent coming down the steps. And this happens on the equinox, right? There's two dates to remember then. Uh, one of them is March 21st, the other is uh, September 21st. And so on either equinox, the shadow of the edge of the pyramid uh, it lands on the edge of the steps here and makes this beautiful serpent come down. It was designed to show you that. Uh, and we have some modern things too. This is the very large uh, telescope array in New Mexico. And it is a radio telescope array. And we'll learn more about this in chapter four actually. But it's a special kind of telescope, uh, radio telescope. It receives radio waves from space. And these telescopes are actually linked together electronically to act like a single telescope. So it's called a, an array, array of telescopes. Uh, so all of these though, are kinds of monuments that are erected uh, by humans to study the skies, right? To study the heavens and celestial objects. So we are gonna study uh, the planets and the sun and the planets and stars and galaxies and galaxy clusters and super clusters. We're gonna to touch on life and what makes life possible. And we will also talk a little bit about the largest scale structure of the universe, which is called cosmology. All of this space, time, matter, energy, right? That's everything. Uh, so the author um, wants to start you off with some interesting kind of concepts. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things to think about is the, the time. How do we measure time? And you might think about time as measured in years, right? How many years have you lived? We celebrate our birthday. And, uh, but in fact, there's many ways to measure time. In fact, the standard unit of time for us in science is the second. Uh, but the author wants you to get the idea that in science, a number isn't meaningful unless it has a unit behind it. And that unit tells you uh, kind of the value of, of the number, right? Without that unit, it's really meaningless. And so every number uh, 
has a unit to go with it, or most numbers do at least. So one way to think about time actually, and I, I think it's fun, is to imagine Stonehenge built 5,000, uh, 3,100 BCE, so 5,100 years ago. Um, and imagine that, you know, we want to think about people and people living at that time and then people living today. If we think about um, the length of time between a woman having a daughter and then her daughter finally having a daughter and so on, the lineage of grandmas, uh, one generation is about 25 years. So if you take that 5,000 years and you divide by 25, you find out that in your past, because you have a grandma and a grandma, 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 grandma you know, right? Your great, 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 205 grandmas ago was around at the time of Stonehenge. And I know you had one because you're alive today, right? Every human being has a, a grandmother and then before them, a great grandmother and great grandmother. You are part of human history, right? Your DNA, actually, we can figure out, you know, your on your mother's side, you can figure out how many generations you were in this part of the world or another part of the world, et cetera. That's kind of a fun idea. All right, so um, we're gonna talk about numbers a little bit and we're gonna see numbers. And, and the idea is that sometimes the numbers are so big or so small, it's hard to get a handle on. And so we wanna try to figure out a way to do that. So we've come up with this concept called order of magnitude. Now the order of magnitude is the nearest power of 10. So um, often the easiest thing to do, by the way, is the next thing that we're gonna be doing, which is learn how to do scientific notation. Uh, and I do wanna teach you, teach you that as well. But let's go ahead and think about a human being. Now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, switch to a different camera and I'm gonna show you, talk about humans, right? So I happen to be a human, right? And actually my, uh, my height, my height, this is me, right? Very simple version of me. <laughs> I haven't taken many drawing classes. Uh, my height is about um, 1.885 meters. That's how tall I am, 1.5, so my height, my height, is 1.85 meters. Now I'm not the tallest person and I'm not the shortest person. So I actually know that human beings have a range of height, right? Little human beings like little kids maybe are the shorter side, right? And then, you know, there's obviously some taller people too. But what is the typical height of a human? So when I look at this number, actually um, the trick is to think about it in terms of scientific notation. And if you use scientific notation, you need um, to remember that there's two parts. There's a number between one and 10, and then times 10 to some power, right? That's what you're gonna have for scientific notation. Well, this number is already between one and 10. So I just copy it down, 1.85. And then, but I need to fit the format. So times 10 to the what? Well, I didn't have to move the decimal place. In fact, 10 to the zero. Okay. Now it doesn't seem like I did very much, but in fact, you need to know something. 10 to the zero power is the same thing as one. Okay. So if you, if you ask the question, you know, how tall is a human being? Is it closer to one meter or closer to 10 meters? Which one is a human being closer to? And the answer is, well, humans are order of magnitude 10 to the zero meters, right? About one meter. So it turns out the nearest power of 10 is 10 to the zero power. Now, why would I jump up to 10 to the first power? Well, the way it works is if you have a scientific notation number, if you have 5.01, actually even five times 10 to the zero, then the order of magnitude is actually going to go up by one. If this number is five or above, then we're going to bump this up by one. So the order of magnitude is actually 10 to the first power. So what we're saying is that in this case, something that is uh, five meters is uh, closer to 10 than it is to one. I, actually, that's not quite true, but this is, the, this is what we do in math. So yeah, don't argue, just do it. But anyways, we're gonna round up. If this number is five or above, we're gonna round it up. Okay, all right, go back to the PowerPoint which you can follow along with, right? So human beings are about 10 to the zero. So how about a planet? A typical planet is about 10 to the sixth power. 
And so you quickly have a way of comparing uh, the size of a planet to a human. A human is about 10 to the 10 to the zero, a planet is 10 to the six. A planet is 10 to the six, uh, is six orders of magnitude larger than a human, right? Because six is six numbers larger than, than zero, okay? And so that means 10 to the sixth power actually is a million times bigger. So a million people laid out end to end would be about the size of a planet. Okay, now Earth is not the typical planet. It's a little bit bigger than this, but again, this is the typical planet. So bigger than a planet is a star, right? A typical star is about 10 to the ninth meters, right? So if you think about that, it means there's nine orders of magnitude bigger than a, a human, but how much bigger than a planet? And so if you compare 10 to the ninth to 10 to the sixth, there's only three magnitudes number, three magnitude numbers difference. They are three orders of magnitude larger. Then it means that it would take about a thousand planets lined up next to each other to be the size of the sun. Now, our sun is actually not typical and our earth is not typical. So just so you know, uh, our earth is actually, earth is about 10 to the seventh meters, right, in size. And our sun is about 10 to the ninth meters in size. So how much bigger is the earth, is the sun than the earth? And the answer is two orders of magnitude. That's a difference of two orders of magnitude. And what it means literally is if you draw a picture of the sun, I know it's not a very good picture, and you draw little earths, you would need to draw 10 to the second, which is 100. You need to draw 100 earths. I didn't really draw 100, but I just want you to imagine I did. It would be 100 earths across. Okay, that's the idea with order of magnitude, okay? We can quickly think about how much bigger one of them is than the other one, okay? So any of these examples that we give you are kind of like that. Now, what about a, a solar system, a planetary system? A solar system includes the star in the middle and the planets and other things around it. So you see a Kuiper belt. There's also an asteroid belt, okay? It's very small right in here. But anyways, we'll talk more about that later. They're about 10 to the 13th meters. So if you compare them to a star, how much bigger is a planetary system? And the answer is four orders of magnitude. Now, four orders of magnitude, 10 to the fourth, means that a solar system is about 10,000 times as big as the star, okay? That's what we're gonna be uh, kind of using this for, okay? Quickly to be able to compare them. How about a galaxy? A galaxy is 10 to the 21st meters across. So again, compare that to an individual star. It'd be 10 to the 12th. That's a trillion times, right? So there are a trillion stars lined up end to end with, to cover a single galaxy. How about uh, solar uh, planetary systems, right? That was 10 to the 13th and 10 to the 21st. The difference is 10 to the eighth, right? Or eight orders of magnitude. 10 to the eighth power is 100 million. So it would take 100 million solar systems to cross the, a single, single galaxy. Okay, something a little bit bigger than a single galaxy is a cluster of galaxies. Galaxy cluster, about 10 to the 23rd meters across. And you can see that's two orders of magnitude larger, which means that there's about 100 galaxies across uh, to get a galaxy cluster. 100 galaxies across, okay? A supercluster is even bigger than that. It's 10 to the 24th. And so that's just one order of magnitude bigger. It turns out that the superclusters represent about 10 of these galaxy clusters across. Okay, so that's pretty much the largest thing that we can imagine. But what if we go in the other direction? What about things that are really small? Okay, so if you think about it, um, Atoms are really small. You've heard about atoms. You maybe already know a lot about them. We're gonna be using, talking about atoms and, and how they work in our class. Uh, this atom in particular is pretty important. It's the atom known as hydrogen. And you should write down that one atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. Okay, so that's 10 orders of magnitude smaller than a human. 
Okay, so let's let's try to understand that number real quick. Okay, so ten to the minus ten actually is a, is the size of an atom. So in your notes you have that ten to the minus ten meters. But what does it even mean, right? What does ten to the minus ten mean? Mathematically, it means one divided by ten to the tenth. Okay, that's what it means. And if I were to write that out, I would have to do a lot of zeros, point zero, 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 one meters, right? That is 10 to the minus 10th. So it is a very small number, okay? Um, anyways, this is, by the way, a lot faster than writing this. And what's smaller than an atom? And the answer is, well, what's in the middle, right? In the middle of an atom, we have something called a nucleus. Uh, in the case of hydrogen, instead of a, a, a bigger thing, you just have a single proton. That's why it's element number one, hydrogen. Uh, a single proton then is about 10 to the minus 15th meters, okay? So um, actually, let's just stop because that's kind of an important, amazing thing to know, right? That one proton is about 10 to the, 10 to the minus 15th meters, okay? So again, just to remind you, it's one over 10 to the 15th. That's what it means. But here's a question, right? Which one's bigger, an atom or a proton? The answer is an atom. 10 to the minus 10 is bigger because it's not as negative, right? So the more negative you get, the smaller you get. So how much bigger is an atom than a proton? When you compare these two, you can see that the numbers are different by five, right? So the answer is 10 to the fifth. Right? So an atom is five orders of magnitude larger than a proton, right? And what does that mean, right? If you take a single proton and you say, how many protons would it take if you lined protons up? I'm not going to do this, right? But imagine doing that. It would take 10 to the fifth protons, right? to be as wide as a single atom. Okay, what's 10 to the fifth mean? 100,000, right? So these protons are incredibly small compared to the size of the atom. That's an interesting fact that we won't talk about too much until later in the course, but pretty cool, uh, interesting fact. Okay, so those are some orders of magnitude. Now, all of this is connected to scientific notation. You need to know scientific notation. So take a look at a few examples right here. All scientific notation works uh, according to the following thing, right? A is a number, uh, wait a second, is a number between one and 10, sorry about that. And B is an integer, okay? So for example, um, here's five billion. And I apologize to Europeans or other people who use periods instead of commas. I, I probably should just take those out, but it's meant to be a quick way to do this. Uh, if you look at this number, you ask the question, where is the decimal point? And if you can't see it, then you automatically assume that it's here at the end of the number. And if you ask, how do I change this into scientific notation? The answer is you move the decimal point. So you're gonna move the decimal point until the number that you get is a number between one and 10. And you'll see, I'm gonna to have to go all the way until it's right behind the five here. And so it's five, five is definitely between one and 10. And then how many times did I have to move it? The answer is times 10 to the ninth power. This is the way to write this number. So you need to be able to either write this number as scientific notation, or if you see this number, be able to write it like this, right? Recognize that this is the same thing. Okay, here's a smaller number just to make it a little easier. 7,500, 7,500, 0, 0, okay? Again, there's no decimal point, so assume it's here, and you go one, two, three places to become 7.5 times 10 to the third. Again, take this number. Can you change it back into this number? You need to be able to go back and forth, okay? Uh, down here are some small numbers now. Here's one, two one thousandths. That's two divided by a thousand or 0 0.002. Now the decimal point is here, but instead of moving it to the left, I need to move it to the right. And if you count one, two, three places, finally becomes two, and we have times 10 to the negative third power. 
okay? So these are small numbers, right? That negative powers are small numbers. Positive powers are large numbers. Here's another example, one, one million or 0 0.000001. Again, you gotta move one, two, three, four, five, six places, and then it becomes one times 10 to the minus six. Okay, so other than writing numbers as scientific notation or being able to write them as regular notation from scientific notation, you also just need to be able to do simple calculations. Simple, I promise, just simple, okay? So add, subtract, multiply, divide. And here are some examples for you. Okay, so again, I'm not gonna go into exhaustive detail. It's just meant to be a quick uh, a, a review if you've never, uh, if you've seen it or just a quick, uh, version if you've never seen this before. Uh, but it's a neat neat trick to be able to multiply, divide, add, and subtract. If you multiply numbers that are scientific notation, in fact, what you do is you multiply the first parts together and then the powers of 10 together, right? So you get three times two, that's six. And then you multiply 10 to the seventh times 10 to the fifth. Again, if you don't know this, please talk to me or talk to Jason, our tutor, and we'll get some hours for him very soon. Uh, but he can teach you how to do this as well. And you get 10 to the seven plus five or 10 to the 12th power. Now here's another example, just a little bit different, but it does have something important to realize, right? Four times 10 to the seven times three times 10 to the fifth. You do three times four, well, that's 12, right? 10 to the seven, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the 12. So this looks pretty good, right? Except that this number is not scientific notation. And so the trick is when you get a number like we just had, right? we have 12 times 10 to the 12th power. What we wanna notice is this part is wrong, right? There's something, it's not a number between one and 10. So how do you change this into a number that's between one and 10? And the answer is you move it one place like this, right? So 1.2, 1 1.2, .2, 1 .2 times 10 to the first is this number, same number, right? 1.2 times 10 to the first, 1.20 times 10 to the first is 12.0, same thing. And then we throw in this, right? Times 10 to the 12th. So 10 to the first times 10 to the 12th is 1.20 times 10 to the 13th. That's how you got the 13 out of that. All right. All right, next up is division. How do you divide? You take the top number divided by the bottom number. Well, what you do is the first parts again, six divided by two, okay? Six divided by two is three. And when you divide powers of 10, this time you subtract the lower power from the upper power. So it's 10 to the fourth divided by 10 to the third is gonna be 10 to the four minus three or 10 to the first power. All right, there's division. Okay, addition and subtraction. Let's do our first example first. If these powers match, then all you have to do is add or subtract the first numbers together. So let me say that the rule is these powers have to match. Okay? And if they don't match, then you have to do something. But they match, then all you have to do is, to, is, is just add or subtract these numbers together, depending on what you want to do. So in this case, it's subtract. So 2.5 minus 1.5 is 1 and then 10 times 10 to the third, you take the power along, right? So addition and subtraction, the power is consistent. So it has to be the same in both numbers. And then the answer will have that same power. Okay, how about for addition and, subtract, uh, addition and subtraction with different powers, okay? In this case, we have to change a number. So let's look at this number right here, one times 10 to the second, it's too small, right? So we need to bump it up to 10 to the third. The way to do that, is to write it like this, 0.1 times 10 to the third. Okay, so again, I wanna show you that that's the same, right? So what's one times 10 to the second? Well, that's a one, move the decimal place two places, you end up with 100. What's 0.1 times 10 to the third? And the same idea, take the 0.1 and move it one, two, three places, and you still get 100, right? It's 100, it's 100, it's the same number. These are the same, okay? So now what you can do with the example that we had is um, uh, we had two times 10 to the third plus 
0.1 times 10 to the third. Here we go. Okay, so we had two times 10 to the third plus 0.1 times 10 to the third. And so you can just take the two first parts and put them together, two plus 0 0.1, 2.1 times 10 to the third. Now, just to show you how this works, uh, one last little detail. Let's take the original problem again. Two times 10 to the third plus one times 10 to the second, okay? So what is two times 10 to the third? Well, that's two with three zeros behind it. That's 2,000. And what's one times 10 to the second? Well, that's 100. Uh, that would have been an easy thing to do. But the idea is learn the technique because then the problems, uh, when they get harder, you'll understand the basic technique. So how do you add 2,100? Well, it's 2,100. And how do I write that number in scientific notation? Well, you're gonna move it once, twice, three times. So you get 2.1 times 10 to the third. And you can see we got the same answer uh, both ways. All right. So again, that's just meant to be a, a quick uh, review or exploration of that. And if you need more help, ask for help. Okay, so some things you need to memorize. These are facts you need to memorize. Number one, the average distance between the Earth and the Sun is a special thing. It's called an astronomical unit, an AU. You need to know that uh, words, astronomical unit, and the symbol AU, okay? You should also know the distance. It is about 93 million, 92.8 million miles, or 149.5 million kilometers, okay? We say often say 93 million miles and 150 million kilometers just to keep it simple, okay? Uh, a light year is also a distance, right? A distance traveled by light in one year. And light is really fast, it turns out. It is about 6 trillion miles. Now, you don't need to know that, but look at that. That's a huge number of miles or nine quadrillion meters, which is nine times 10 to the 15th meters. Light travels an incredibly large distance in one year. Okay, now, um, we'll learn again later on, but there's another way to measure distance called the parsec. So you just want to just hear it and, and write down the definition. The definition of a parsec, abbreviated PC, is 3.26 light years. So a little more than, you know, three light years, a little more. That's enough for you to know now, okay? And finally, the speed of light. Speed of light is amazingly fast. It's 186,000 miles per second. 300 million meters per second or three times 10 to the eight meters per second, okay? Those are really uh, big numbers. Speed of light is amazing. Okay, so what is science exactly, right? And so this is, a, this is kind of the last part of the, the, uh, the chapter is learning how we make uh, new information in science and it's called the scientific method. And it's been honed from, from years and years of exploration. Um, and so you want to know how it basically works. Now, I was talking to a um, student earlier, and, and when, you, when you begin the scientific method, how do you begin? You don't actually begin with a hypothesis. You begin with a question, right? That was a good way to think about it. Uh, you observe the world, and you ask a question about it. How does it work, or what's going on? And, and in fact, it doesn't have to be something you know so crazy and, and uh, something that's very difficult to do. It could be in your own life. You could use the scientific method to make your life better. So for example, I had a problem. Um, uh, actually, I, I found a solution, but I had a problem. My very first day as a tenure track professor, uh, here I'm telling you a story. So here we go. My, the very first day as a tenure track professor, I, I came to school to teach my class, my first class on campus as a tenure professor. And I got to class, I got to school an hour before my class started and I couldn't find a place to park. I had no idea it was gonna be so bad. And so I sat around for a little while and it started to get later and later and I still couldn't find a place to park. And so now I was like getting a little desperate. I went down to the student parking area and it was worse. There were students everywhere waiting for spaces. There was no place to park. I went back up to this, the faculty parking lot again, and there were still no spaces. 
So I was actually late for my very first class that I taught at SBCC. I'm a little embarrassed by that, but you know, I learned a lesson that day. I learned that actually on the other side of campus, there's plenty of parking or it was easier and I was able to walk, it's five minutes away, it was no big deal. So I never, I was never late again, but that one time I was late. I mean, I actually have been close to being late though. And in, in, in my past, I, I, I did worry about being late. So let's say you wanted to, um, you have a problem, you're late, okay? And you, that you recognize that problem and you wanna try to do something about it. You can use the scientific method uh, to change that, right? You can make it better. So you start off, I'm late, I observe I'm late. Okay, so now I need to make a hypothesis. How do I get to school on time? Well, I know the answer, right? And you know the answer to get up earlier, leave earlier. But, um, you know, so I make, a, I make a hypothesis. In order to be at my class at quarter to eight, you know, in my classroom by quarter to eight, I need to leave my house by 8.15, okay? So I make a hypothesis and that'll give me time to park and get to my office, you know, drink my coffee or whatever I need to do. And so I, I would try to, I would make a hypothesis. And then the next step is to perform an experiment. And so I would do an experiment. I would come to, I would leave at 7.15 and I would get to school. Okay, so, and the final step is to evaluate the, the experiment, right? So I would, the data would be, did I get to school on time? And how, what time did I get there, right? Was it, was it too early? You know, maybe it was too early. And so no matter what I do is I analyze the results of my experiment and I feed back, right? So I either, let's say I was late again, then I would say, well, you need to leave a little earlier. But actually in this case, I was a little bit um, early. I'm like, wow, I'm really early right now. And so I found out that I had a, a, a few more minutes. I could change it. I could make it 720 and that was okay. Or 725, you know, you can, you can change your hypothesis uh, with the new information. Okay, so that's an example of how you can use um, the scientific method in your life to make your life better. But let's go ahead and look at the steps. Uh, so you observe something in the world and you wanna try to understand it. So what do you do next? You create a hypothesis. Now, most of us have learned a definition of a hypothesis as an educated guess. But the word guess sounds a little bit haphazard and it's not that at all. Okay. In fact, in science, what we do before we make a hypothesis is we review all the work that other people have done, and we use that information to help us generate the best hypothesis that we can. So the best hypothesis is the one that is using the information that is already there or that you have acquired to generate your best idea of how a system works, right? It could be quantitative or qualitative. Quantitative is a little more powerful means you predict a, a number uh, outcome uh, of the situation. For example, I could predict the time that I would arrive at school. That would be a numerical hypothesis. Or if I just said early, that would be more qualitative and it wouldn't be quite as, as powerful. Okay, the next step, you must, uh, after making a hypothesis, you must perform an experiment. You have to test it. So at, if you cannot test it, right, either it's, it's just not possible technologically, it's not possible, or you can't see something or whatever, you're not the right person to do the experiment, then it's not science, okay? If it cannot be experimented, if there's no experiment that can be done, it's not science, okay? Now, the outcome of the, si the experiment can either refute or support your hypothesis, but either way you learn, right? So um, if, it, if it refutes your hypothesis, then you're gonna need to take the new information and generate a new hypothesis. I actually would have just drawn it back up here and make a new hypothesis to the experiment. But anyways, um, and whether you, you do or not, right, the new observations that you have are gonna help you refine your hypothesis, right? So if I wanna change the time that I leave just a little bit, I'm gonna use the data that I just collected to make the next hypothesis, okay? And of course, you can, you can start to apply this knowledge. Okay. Now, if you do an experiment over and over again, and you find that you get consistent results every single time, we have another name for that. We actually call that a theory. Okay. So examples of theories would be the theory of gravity, uh, the theory of relativity. Those are two theories that you should be aware of. There's actually two versions of relativity, but those would be examples that I think you all should have in your mind. And what they, what they are meant to represent is not just like a maybe situation. It's something that has been thoroughly 
uh, tested over and over again, it seems to hold true. Okay, we really feel very strongly about these ideas. Okay, so theory in, in colloquial language, in the English language, seems to imply something like uh, you're not sure about. But in science, it's something that represents a lot of work, right? It's not just uh, a random thing. It's something that people have studied quite a bit and seems to hold true. Now, there are even some principles that are even stronger than that and we will call them laws, right? So for example, a law of conservation of energy or the law of conservation of momentum or angular momentum or the law of conservation of matter, right? Those are things that we have never seen violated, okay? Uh, so they become even more powerful. Okay, so pseudoscience is a concept uh, that it may look like science, right? It makes predictions. But if you are rigorous and you test it, you find out it doesn't really work. It's not repeatable. And it, it can't be tested by anybody um, equally, right? Some people are better at astrology than others, right? They have the right touch, the right ability, okay? So um, that's not science, right? If one person has to do it or it doesn't work, that's not science, right? Science is something that can be done by anyone with the right expertise and the right equipment. Uh, so whenever you have somebody who claims that only they can see or only they can do, it is not science anymore, right? So if someone says, I see ghosts, right? And, and you can't see them because they're only going to show themselves to me. Well, I need you to be skeptical, okay? That's not real. Uh, a scientific claim is one that can be tested by anyone with the right equipment and experience. So they may look through though. So a little challenge to you if you like astrology, um, and I, I, you know, I look at my horoscope just for fun. Uh, it's usually just entertainment. But one of the, the things that I would challenge you to do is when you look for your horoscope, instead of looking at yours, look at another one and ask, does it fit me? And what I've found is when I tested myself, uh, I would find that there were several that could easily be, you know, that could fit me. Um, and so I, I just encourage you to be skeptical. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. So anyways, we kind of discussed the, the claims of uh, extraterrestrials. So extraterrestrials, I don't really believe we've been visited. I would love to think that we have, but there's no credible evidence in my mind. Okay. Again, if people uh, cannot show you, uh, the more incredible the claim, the more powerful the evidence needs to be. Okay. So you should be incredibly skeptical and ask for a lot of evidence when somebody makes a big claim. So here are a couple of examples and you, you should be able to go through. My sign is a Leo, science or pseudoscience. We're gonna say pseudoscience. A ball drops when released. That's part of the law of gravity or theory of gravity rather, theory of gravity. And, uh, and that would be science. Uh, the date and time of eclipses are well known. And one of the things we'll talk about is how we know that information, and that is definitely true. Uh, we do know the date, date and times because of science, uh, the patterns that we've seen. If you take this supplement, so I'm, you know, I'm just going to make something up: alpha B uh, redox, you know, riboflavin. I don't know. I've just made something up. I don't know anything. I'm sure that's wrong, but um, is that going to be beneficial? Well, so maybe I believe it is, right? For me personally, I've been taking it and I feel great. And I, you know, I think it works. And then I tell my friend, I'm like, you got to try this. This is great stuff. And they try it. Is it always going to be true that when you take a supplement, it's going to help you? And the answer is, well, probably not, right? You may find that some things work for some people and some things don't work. And, and the reason is we don't know, you know, all the little subtle details that might make it function. So when you make a claim uh, that something is going to work, you, you know, really, it's difficult to say that it's going to work for everyone. Human beings are different. You know, we have some subtle differences and our health is not always going to respond in the same way uh, to a supplement. So I would call that pseudoscience. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy is outside of the Milky Way galaxy. We will learn that and how we found that out. And that is definitely science. Okay. Humans do not cause climate change. So the author is pretty, um, pretty uh, obvious in his uh, feelings, right? He's pretty frank. That was a little joke because his last name is Frank. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like the people that believe the earth is flat. There are some people that believe that humans are not changing the planet's climate. And at this point, it's a little hard to 
to reconcile with the data. So this year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is the hottest year on record, okay? And last year was the hottest year on record. I mean, it's pretty consistent. It's almost every year becomes the hottest year ever, okay? Now that's not such a great sign. It means that we're headed in a direction that we don't necessarily want to have, right? A little temperature change doesn't hurt us. And in fact, some of us are going to be fine no matter what, right? You know, a few degrees, what's the matter? But there are a number of people on the earth who will not be okay, especially if they live near the shore with ocean levels rising. Uh, people that live near the shore are going to be affected in a negative way. There's going to be more flooding. Uh, there'll be more disasters uh, that end up destroying their homes and their and their livelihoods and taking human lives as well. Uh, so just check your answers, make sure you got them right, okay, according to the author. Uh, science and religion, do they have to be in conflict? Absolutely not. In fact, it is okay to be religious and a scientist at the same time. You will find that there are a number of people who have managed to balance uh, both of those lives. Uh, one thing that science does not teach you is how to be a good person. Okay, I'm gonna pause because that's an important thing, right? How, do you, how are you gonna be a good person? Maybe religion or your spiritual ideas or other philosophy of life allow you to be a good person. And I want you to be a good person. I hope you're a good person already. Uh, and if you were here in person, I would talk a little bit about that, that we, we can be good to each other. We can be patient and kind and gentle uh, with each other whenever possible. And you will have an opportunity to work with people in this class. Uh, please be gentle, okay? Don't be critical. I mean, critical in a, a help us grow sense, but not critical in the sense like, wow, you made a mistake, that's horrible. It's just everybody makes mistakes. So be gentle. And most of all, be gentle with yourself. Give yourself room to make mistakes. You're human. And so part of the learning process is to make a mistake. So make a mistake, learn from it, and move forward. Don't, don't give yourself such a hard time that you can't get over it, okay? Uh, but we are, are not supposed to be in conflict with religion. I'm not going to try to convince you to believe in one religion or another. That's not where I'm a, I'm not going to try to teach you anything about religion, okay? So you learn from, from religious uh, books and, peop and your, you know, people that you trust and uh, learn science from me, okay? So there are some problems in the past, right? Historically, there are people who have been persecuted for uh, their beliefs, uh, but yeah, we're gonna skip past that. Okay, so, so a couple of things just to be aware of that um, climate change is real and every climate scientist in the world will acknowledge this is absolutely real and actually Every legitimate climate scientist agrees that human beings are the cause, okay? So we see effects. Uh, that was a big, big debate 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but today it's kind of, it's, it would be really hard to, to imagine people saying that with a straight face. Human beings are, are definitely causing changes to our environment. Uh, in fact, they've even named it a new era, uh, the, the new uh, era, geologic era, the Paleocene. I believe is what it's called. Uh, so you can see right here, the temperature is going up uh, over time. And I already mentioned that. Here is another picture that's showing the carbon dioxide levels and historical levels. You see, this was the biggest that we had ever seen. And now from 1915 on, we're just going up. Okay, and it's even, yeah, it's above 400 now. 415, I believe is the latest number. Um, so parts per million. And what is the consequence? Well, we see temperatures rising around the globe. This is part of a greenhouse gas. Now there's another little side fact. Well, I'll tell you more about this later, but the, this effect is changing the planet in other ways, which then leads to further effects. So it's a compound effect. So it's not just this. Carbon dioxide is released when we use fossil fuels but the impact on the temperature of the planet has then caused further damage. So it's very likely that the earth will survive with or without us. But if we wanna live here and we wanna live in a, in a place or our, we want our kids to live in a place that is beautiful and wonderful as we see, then we need to take care of it and our grandkids as well, right? Should we be the ones to solve the problems or should we let our, our, our you know, the people who come after us solve the problems. And I would say that we should, we should be the ones. 
So final uh, slide here, take a look. This is an amazing picture. I wonder if you can guess where this picture was taken. Just look at that beautiful blue ball. That's every human being that has ever lived, has lived on that ball. But one of the, the amazing things to realize is one day soon, uh, people will be living off the earth, right? We will have people living maybe permanently off the earth. So where was this picture taken? If you didn't figure it out, you'll notice from the blackness of the sky, there's no atmosphere. This is the moon, right? And you might have a chance one day to go walking on the moon. I am, I'm so excited for you to have that. I don't know if I am, I might be too old, but some of you might be able to take a vacation to the moon one day and bounce around uh, the one sixth of gravity. Oh, it'll be amazing. So I look forward to that for you. And uh, thank you guys for your attention. This is the end of 